begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, today we are thankful. We're thankful for the life you've given to us. We're thankful for the words you've given to us. And we're thankful that by your Holy Spirit we can continue in life. Father, I pray that you'll guide us now as we open your word, speak to us from it. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. It had been a tough night without a whole lot of rest. Have you ever had a tough night? The disciples of Jesus had heard him preach several parables. He'd been preaching most of the day to a very large crowd, something that we're not able to do today. They had had all day long with Jesus. And we pick up the story in the Gospel according to Mark chapter 4. It's time for a relaxing cruise across the sea. Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Well, that sounds good. A cruise across the sea with Jesus. Everything looks calm and peaceful. An evening cruise, maybe they got to see the sunset. Verse 36, leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats were with him. It sounds like some social distancing is taking place. Verse 37, and there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Well, Matthew's account describes this storm that comes up using a Greek word for earthquake. The waters were tossed about. It was a wild sea. But hey, there's nothing to worry about because some of these men are experienced fishermen and they're used to being on the water. They've got experts in the boat. Their best minds are on top of this problem and the boat is still filling with water. In their case, it appears the boat is going down. Have you ever faced a challenge in which you're doing your very best and your best doesn't seem good enough? Verse 38, Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Yeah, do you not care? Have you ever cried out to God? Do you not care? Has it ever seemed like God is asleep in your boat? I remember a time in my agnostic, atheistic period of life when I cried out to a God whom I wasn't even sure existed. Don't you care? If you're there, was how my prayer started. I can tell you today, God answers prayer. And he is real. Verse 39. And he got up, that is, Jesus got up, and he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And the King James Version says, Peace, be still. And don't we need the peace today? I'll say it again, God answers prayer. The wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And then verses 40 through chapter 5, verse 1 say, And he said to them, Why are you afraid? And people today are afraid, right? Why are we afraid? Jesus asked, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They became very much afraid. <laughs> That's interesting. Why are you afraid? And they became very much afraid. They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. Now, they've had a, rough, a long day and a rough night, little sleep. It's time to relax. The sun is coming up. They're sitting there on the deck of their boat, sipping their favorite beverage, right? No, I doubt they were sipping anything. They were just thankful that they were alive. What about us? You might, if you were in this story, you might think, well, that's the end of a bad chapter in our life, and now everything's going to be smooth and easy. 
The sea is calm. The sun's coming up. It's beautiful. And this is where we pick up the, the rest of the story. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man would, a man, excuse me, <laughs> when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Whoa. Matthew tells us there were actually two men. Different writers, different witnesses, different reporters. My guess is there were two men and one of them stood out is why Mark is only writing about the one. But when they get out of the boat, immediately there's this man who's been living among the tombs. What kind of man lives among the tombs? Not the kind of man that most of us would want to hang around with. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. So here's a guy who's kind of like in a maximum security prison setting. He's off there, and nobody can hold him. No prison could hold him. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. This guy that meets Jesus and his disciples has almost superhuman strength, and it's pretty scary. The Bible goes on in verse 5, telling us a little bit more about this man. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gnashing himself with stones. I don't know if I were in that area, if I would want to be walking among those mountains in the dark, but can you imagine walking through the mountains and you're hearing the voice of this man screaming? Who knows what he's screaming? Gashing himself with stones, self-mutilating himself. Uh, that was redundant, but you got the picture. And maybe there's some message for us here to not mess with evil angels or demons. But clearly the man has a mental health issue. An extreme issue. And he sees in verse 6, it says, Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. It's like he's, he's running to attack Jesus, then he recognizes in Jesus a friend, and he falls down even to worship. But verse 7, he's shouting with a loud voice, he says, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. Instead of worship, out comes the voice of the evil spirits. And it reminds me of the old Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons. The spirits are about to speak, and then it's like, oh, wrong spirits. Um, for he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, in a Roman legion, there are three to 5,000 men, 3,000 to 5,000 men in a Roman legion. Apparently, these, this man or these two men that dwelt among the tombs were the really hard cases, the real social misfits. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Satan's plan, I believe, was to cause economic hardship, to have people reject Jesus because of the economic hardship, their financial loss. The herd of swine was obviously valuable to the, the swine owners, they're paying people out there to herd the swine. And Jesus gives the permission in verse 13. The Bible says Jesus gave them permission and coming out of the unclean spirits entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. I don't know what that was really like, but I imagine 
a herd of a couple thousand swine. It's a pretty noisy group to start with. Filthy, dirty. And now they're all running down the hill in a stampede-like fashion, squealing and snorting as they rush over the cliff and into the sea and drown. And I don't imagine they drown quickly, but they're squealing and thrashing and the water is churning and it's a mess. And the witnesses are terrified. And in verse 14, it says, Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. The devil's plan, Satan's plan, backfires, and it becomes a witness to the power of Jesus Christ and the authority of Jesus Christ. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed and in his right mind. The very man who had been who had the legion, and they became frightened. Throughout the story, we see this element of fear. The disciples are fear. They're afraid as their boat looks like it's going to go down. They're afraid when they come to the shore and they meet this man. I don't know, the, it doesn't say for sure what happens to the disciples in this particular passage, but I imagine when they got to shore and they met the demoniacs, they ran back to the boat. And there's Jesus talking with the demon-possessed man. And now the townspeople are afraid. And there's a lot of fear in our world today. Not just fear of COVID-19, fear of many things. Fear that there might not be enough. Fear that there be too much. Fear that there might be sadness, sickness, death. All kinds of fear. The townspeople are afraid. Why are they afraid? Here's a demoniac that everybody has been terrified of, and now he's sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they're afraid. It doesn't make sense. But fear often doesn't make sense. Maybe it was too much change too fast. Maybe it was uncontrollable change. Because they weren't able to control it, they were afraid. Change can be frightening. Speed can be frightening. Well, anyway, verse 16, the Bible goes on and says, Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. This story isn't, by the way, about clean and unclean meat. This story isn't about communication with spirits. This is a story about the power of God's grace about God's love for humanity. It's a story of love and acceptance and forgiveness. Verse 17, the Bible says, And they began to implore him to leave their region. I just don't get this. Here's Jesus. He comes. He takes care of a, a problem in the community. These demoniacs now are no longer a problem. But the people want Jesus to leave. I wonder why people are afraid of Jesus. Is it because he is powerful? Because he does make a difference? Because he truly is God? Maybe they were afraid of what else might happen? What else might happen in their lives? Fear is a powerful thing. Well, Jesus listens to their plea. And I believe Jesus listens to our plea every day. They implore him to leave their region. Verse 18 tells us he does. It says, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. Right here I want to ask a question. Have you ever heard that religion and faith in Jesus Christ is a crutch? That it's something only for the weak or the foolish or the crazy? Is Jesus only for those who need a crutch? I would answer the question with a yes and a no. Crutches are for the sick. Crutches are for the injured. Cr crutches are for the weak. But Jesus changes the weak and the foolish and the crazy. He gives strength and wisdom and a sound mind. Christ is for the strong. 
the strong demoniacs who didn't think they needed anybody. They were so strong that chains couldn't hold them, so strong that the shackles would break, so strong that they didn't need anyone else, so they lived among the tombs. So yes, Jesus is for the weak, Jesus is for the strong. Jesus is for every one of us, for the whole world, the Bible tells us. And I believe that it's the grace of God that leads us to have changed lives, the grace of God that gives sound minds. And what is the response of a sound mind? How do we calm the storms of life in our own heads, the things that make us afraid, the things that cause us to worry? We see in this story the response of a sound mind, and the first response is a desire to be with Jesus. The demoniac pled, he implored, the, the New American Standard Version says, he implored Jesus that he could go along with Jesus. He wanted to be with Jesus, and that's the number one response of a sound mind, to be with the one who is the desire of ages. The second response of a sound mind, of having this peaceful walk with Jesus, not just the desire to be with Jesus, but the obedience of faith in Jesus. You see, there's power, the power of Christ, the power of Christ to change us from madmen to missionaries from miserable to messengers of grace, from demoniacs to disciples. Now, what about you and me? What about you and me? Are we self-confident? Are we sinful? Are we sin-addicted? Do we face disease? Do we have bad habits? Are our lives messed up? The grace of God leads to changed lives. The renewing of the mind, the Bible says. We can have peace of mind without being guilty, without this sense of guilt. God wants us to have this peace. There's much more we could say in this passage, and maybe we will. <laughs> Verse 20, the Bible says, and he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. Now, as a preacher of the gospel, I believe in going and telling everybody about Jesus. Here's a man who just had met Jesus, wants to be with Jesus, and one of our lights just went out. <laughs> uh, this man wants to be with Jesus, and he has had zero training in how to share the gospel with other people. No training whatsoever. Jesus doesn't give him a five-point seminar on how to proclaim the gospel, how to tell others about what God has done for you. All he says is, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he had mercy on you. A short seminary, short seminarian experience. Jesus says, just go home, share. I find that amazing. Jesus wants the whole world to hear the gospel, the good news. He doesn't tell the, the, the demoniac, Go to school for three years so you can tell people what God is like. He doesn't say that's a bad thing. But he didn't, he didn't require it. He says, go, tell what God has done for you. And this is truly what witnessing is about. This is what telling God is, uh, God's good news to the world is like. God wants us to share with other people. After all, it is a priesthood of all believers. So we come back to this calming of the storm on the sea of life. How do we calm these storms? That first response is key. We want to be with Jesus. I believe the second response is to trust him enough 
to, to do what he tells us, to follow his will, to follow his words. Let Jesus Christ give you a sound mind, a mind that desires to be with him, a mind that obeys him by faith, a mind that knows that the power of his grace and love is active and in your life. And then testify of what great things the Lord has done for you. God bless you. Let's close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, today we have heard your word. We have, we've heard about your son, Jesus Christ, a true gift to us. And Father, we've seen how the storms of life can be calmed through faith in your son. And how, Lord, the proper response is to desire to walk with Jesus, to be with Jesus in communion this way, by faith. And then to have this obedience of faith, the righteousness of Christ in us. Father, I pray that you would bless each person watching today, that you would give them peace of mind, that you would give them a sound mind, and that you would give peace on the sea of life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.